Hello, so good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Sam Reddy for the kind invitation. I'm very glad to be here. So, uh, today I will talk about continuous descriptions of dry active matter. And this work has been done in collaboration with many different people over the years. So, in particular, Hugues Chaté and Guillaume Grégoire in Paris. Also, PhD students working with Hugues Chaté, Sandrine Go, Anton Peshkov. Sebastian Leonard was a postdoc, and this also in collaboration with Francesco Ginelli, Igor Aronson, and uh, Sriram Ramaswamy at Hyderabad. So as you know, uh, this nice meeting is about nonlinear physics of disordered system from, amorph from amorphous solids to complex flows. I have the feeling my talk is a little bit out of focus. However, I wanted to emphasize that clearly I will be talking about nonlinear physics, that's for sure. And in some broad sense, you can imagine that this is also a little bit of complex flow. So why? Well, I will consider uh, some physical models which are initially inspired by the collective motion of animal groups, like herds of mammals or flocks of birds. And if you think of uh, such a large assemblies of animal as a fluid, you would certainly consider that this collective motion is a spontaneous flow. So, let me call that spontaneous flow in active matter. It's very spontaneous. It's always a response to something. A, 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 you know, no, no, a precisely. A, a plane. This never runs like this without a plane flying over. <laughs> well. So it's not spontaneous. It's, uh, it's okay. Easy. I leave this to biologists to decide whether this is spontaneous or not. But in the models that we consider, it is definitely spontaneous. And biologists say that, at least for some species, uh, there is collective motion without any leader and without external sources. But OK, I'm not, or external fields or whatever. But I'm not an expert in, in these biological issues. Anyhow, I will uh, focus more on models in the following. And so if you want to do more quantitative experiments, you can go uh, to small scale biological systems like driven filaments uh, or microtubules, for instance, where uh, you, can, you really have control parameters that you can tune and it's, uh, it's much more quantitative, let's say. So turning to physics, well, uh, physicists have been interested in the last years about artificial kinds of uh, active particles. For instance, you can use uh, genus particles, which are spheres which are coated with two different metals. So two half spheres have, have different coating and due to some reaction, uh, with uh, chemical products in the solution, this induces a field which, uh, well, so this induces some gradients and some flow which propels the particle. This has been done, for instance, by Palachi and Bokeh and co workers. Uh, among other systems, you can consider self propelled droplets, like done by uh, Tutu Pali and co workers. And I'm showing here two examples of shaken asymmetric grains. So here are the experiments of uh, Kudroli and co-workers. So here the grain asymmetry is due to uh, the repartition of mass. So they have an asymmetric repartition of mass and the, the plate is vibrated. And due to this asymmetry of mass, the grains uh, are proper. They move in one given direction on average. Here is another experiment in the same spirit by uh, De Seigne and Dosho in Paris. And here the grains have no asymmetry of shape. They are circular, so these are circular disks, but they have, they have an asymmetry of friction. And so when the plate is vibrated, uh, they jump, and when they fall back, they just move a little bit forward due to this asymmetry of friction. So in this system, you can see some collective motion. For instance, if you take a region of interest in the middle here, you see some uh, spontaneous flow across this region of interest. So this has been characterized in quite a lot of details in these papers. Right, so let me now turn to theoretical aspects. Uh, if you want to model such phenomenon, okay, what would you do? First thing to do, of course, is to consider numerical simulations, numerical approaches. So uh, this kind of approach was initiated by uh, Vicek and co-workers 20 years ago. They proposed a minimal model of point-like particles in two dimensions, which have a velocity alignment. So basically, particles tend to align with the velocity of their neighbors. And uh, 
So it's purely local alignment. There is no global information. I mean, a, a given particle does not have any global information in the system. And so Vicek and co-workers show that there was a collect, uh, transition to collective motion in systems which were rather small at that time. And this model has been uh, extensive, extensively studied later on by uh, Grégoire and Chaté. And they showed that there was indeed uh, a transition to collective motion, which can be shown to be actually continue, discontinuous due to the appearance of uh, nonlinear waves. Okay, I will come back to this later on. So if you want to go beyond this kind of minimal simplistic models, you can maybe consider models with more physical interaction in a sense, for instance, you can include, you can take into account excluded volume interactions at the contact between particles or maybe put springs between some particles, etc. And so there have been many, many papers uh, working along this line. So I just mentioned a few of them, like by Perwani and co-workers, or the group of Erwin Frey, Aparna Baskaran, Gerhard Gompers, etc., etc. Okay, so now if you want to go beyond numerical simulations on the theoretical side, you may want to consider coarse grain descriptions uh, in terms of continuous equations. So one way to do it is to start from symmetry considerations and write down uh, continuous equations in a sense like the Navier-Stokes equation, but you will have more terms which are allowed due to uh, symmetry because in this problem there are less symmetries than in usual fluids. For instance, uh, the Galilean invariant symmetry is broken. So this approach has been pioneered by uh, Turner and Two uh, soon after the publication of the Vitschek model. And also there have been uh, later works, so for instance, by Sriram Ramaswamy and co-workers. Also in the same spirit, there have been many works on active gels, but I won't talk about that in detail. So now, okay, if you don't want to have just uh, phenomenological equations with unknown coefficient, you may want to start from some microscopic model and derive the continuous equations so that uh, you know the expressions of the coefficient and things are more controlled in a sense. So this is the goal of the present talk. And this is uh, what we did basically in this work. So I just want to mention also uh, some works by other groups, for instance, Baskaran Marchetti, Thomas Hiller, uh, Roman Schuch and Szymanski Geyer, Weber and Frey, etc. Right, so in this talk I will consider different microscopic models of dry active matter. So what I mean by dry is that simply we consider undamped particles moving on the substrate in two dimension and there is no surrounding fluid. Well, in some experimental situations, there may be some surrounding fluid, but it plays no important role in the dynamics. What we mean basically by no surrounding things is that there are no hydrodynamic interactions mediated by the fluid between the different particles. So we really have local interactions, uh, under them dynamics, and so on. So the common feature of the different models I will consider is that uh, there is, I mean, the particle carry a heading vector, basically, or they have at least a direction that can be pneumatic or polar. And uh, the particle motion is along this particular direction, which can uh, also turn. And so you can vary two things, basically, either the symmetry of motion, it can be a self-propelled motion, the particle is just going on in the same direction with maybe some angular noise, or uh, it can just go back and forth along this direction, so it's uh, kind of uh, biased, well, it's diffusion, but with a preferred direction, it's not isotropic. And second symmetry you can vary is the symmetry of the interaction, so you can have ferromagnetic interactions between particles or nematic interactions, meaning that uh, you can reverse the polarity of a particle and it doesn't change anything, basically. Okay, so the main results are uh, for these different types of models, the derivation of continuous equations for the relevant order parameters, which may be either polar order parameter or nematic order parameter. And then the study of the behavior of these equations, like uh, steady state, the instabilities, the onset of order, and possibly nonlinear patterns. Okay, so I will start by the case of uh, polar self-propelled particles. And uh, this is 
the case on which I will give more details. I will go quicker on the two following cases. Right. So let me start by defining the model. Uh, so as I said, we consider point-like particles on a 2D plane. They have a velocity a v, uh, so it's a vector. And to model the self-propulsion, we simply assume that this vector has a fixed magnitude. So we simply uh, model the velocity by an angle theta. It is the, the only uh, dynamical variable in the system. So you can, you can have two the stochastic process in the dynamic. One is, simple, one is simply a diffusion of the angle, which is more here a run and tumble type, meaning that the particle goes straight and uh, with randomly, at random times, the, the direction of the velocity just changes by some random amount. And there are also some binary collisions. So to d define more precisely the, these dynamics, so uh, for the self-diffusion, the angle is changed by an amount eta, uh, at, as I said, at random time. And this eta is, this, is taken, is grown from a Gaussian distribution of variance sigma squared. And obviously the more, most interest, interesting rule is uh, the collision rule. So in this case, when two incoming particles are just coming closer than some interaction distance, they take uh, the average direction, which I call theta bar, plus some random noise, which is independent for the two particles. So uh, after collision, the, the angle of the first particle is equal to the, to the average angle plus some eta one, and uh, same for, uh, for the second particle, where the noise is eta two. So both noise are independent and taken from some Gaussian distribution with a variance sigma square. So to simplify, we take the same variance for the two distribution, but we could play with these parameters also. Okay, so the principle of the description is to use a kinetic theory approach. Basically, this means that we describe the evolution uh, of the one particle phase space distribution, F, which is a probability to have a particle at position R with the velocity angle theta at time t. And, of course, as in most uh, kinetic theory, you need some approximation scheme to write down the equation, to close a hierarchy of equation. And we use here the simplest possible uh, closure, which is just to factorize the two-particle distribution as a product of one-particle distribution. So it's standard Boltzmann approximation. Okay, so we use the following uh, Boltzmann equation, which is written here. So there's local time derivative. There is an advection term, meaning simply that particles follow their velocity vector. And there are two integral terms, uh, one describing the uh, self-diffusion events I was mentioning, and the other one describing the colli collision events. So the approximation that I just mentioned above has to be done in this collision integral, which is then a bilinear integral of uh, this distribution F. Right. So to go to a continuous description, we want to uh, describe some relevant fields. So the relevant slow fields in the dynamics are the density field, which is associated to the conservation of the number of particles. This is why this is a slow field. And the second field is uh, the velocity field, or momentum field, which here is assumed to be slow, not because of momentum conservation. There is no momentum conservation. but it can be slow close to the onset of motion uh, just because it is uh, uh, an order parameter for the broken symmetry. Right. So our first hydrodynamic equation that can be very easily derived, the continuity equation, which simply uh, expresses the conservation of the number of particles. This is just a trivial equation to derive. And of course, more interesting, is uh, the derivation of a velocity field equation akin to the Navier-Stokes equation. And the principle is the following. So I won't go at all into the details, but you start from the Boltzmann equation. You multiply it by uh, this uh, unit vector in direction theta. You integrate over theta. And then you need some closure scheme, some approximation and closure scheme. So uh, first of all, we expand this distribution function f in angular Fourier coefficients. 
And then close to the linear instability threshold that uh, can be shown to appear in this equation, we just make a truncation. Okay, we have some scaling gensas. I don't go into the details here, but we have a truncation in which we keep only the uh, three first modes. So the mode k equals zero, which is simply the density field. The mode k equals one, which corresponds to the polar uh, order parameter. And k equals two, which is actually the nematic order parameter. But we enslave uh, this nematic order parameter to the polar order parameter. So I have to keep, so I have to keep in the end only an equation for density field and uh, polar order parameter. So in the end, once we can translate back uh, Fourier coefficients into uh, vectorial notations, we end up with such a continuous equation, which is in a sense similar again to the Navier-Stokes equation, but there are additional terms. So what is similar to the Navier-Stokes equation is, of course, the time derivative here. There is something similar to a pressure gradient here. There is a viscous term here. Okay, there is also an advection term, but it is slightly different because the coefficient in front <coughs> is not the same as the usual coefficient, which would be, would be one of the density in this notation. This difference comes from the fact that there is no longer uh, any uh, Galilean invariance in this problem. And the most important additional term is this one. So this is a purely local term. There are no gradients in it. And this term uh, may give rise to uh, some local instability. So this is what I will discuss now. So uh, we know all the coefficients appearing in the equation as a function of uh, the microscopic parameters, which are basically the noise amplitude, sigma, and also uh, the local density. So you see, for instance, the local density appears in this coefficient and in this coefficient. And of course, it is very convenient to have uh, this, uh, this micro these expressions of the transport coefficient as a function of the microscopic parameter just because it reduces the number of parameters in the problem. So instead of having here uh, five unknown parameters, you have only uh, two or even one, which is sigma and, and the density. Right, so let me come now to the study of the stability properties. So <coughs> first thing to do is to study the stability of homogeneous solution. So obviously, um, ah, okay, so let me look at homogeneous solution. So I drop all gradient terms, and what I obtain is this simple equation, Landau type equation, in which obviously W equals zero, so state without any collective motion is a solution. And its stability, the stability of W equals zero, is related to the sign of this coefficient mu, this linear coefficient. This is the expression of this linear coefficient, and it depends on density. And actually, it is an increasing function of density for small enough noise. Meaning that uh, if rho is large enough, mu becomes positive, and so w equals zero becomes unstable. So for a density which is larger than uh, this transition density rho t. So beyond this uh, density, as you can see from this equation, you have a bifurcated solution which exists with a magnitude w0, which is given by the square root of mu of xi. So if you plot this in the phase diagram, which is uh, given by the noise amplitude of the function of density, overall density, you get a simple transition line like this, separating a region with no collective motion and a region where a priori there is collective motion, meaning at this stage that uh, the state without any collective motion is linearly unstable. Now, of course, we need to go a little bit beyond that. And to go beyond, we have to study the effect of finite length scale perturbations. So what we do is to uh, introduce uh, small perturbations in the field, so in the density field and in the momentum field, let's say. Uh, so we linearize the equations in this perturbation and assume a form like this with uh, an exponential growth rate and a finite wave, wave vector Q. And uh, if you now expand, so you want to compute the real part of this growth rate to know whether there's an instability or not. And this uh, growth rate can be expanded 
for uh, small, small values of Q, meaning for large wave, wavelengths. And we find that close enough to the transition line, uh, the dominant coefficient, so proportional to Q square, is, uh, is positive, meaning that there is a large wavelength instability. So uh, you can also do a more involved calculation. It has to be done numerically. And if you do the whole stability analysis numerically, what you find for the phase diagram is basically this. So this is, again, the phase diagram in the place uh, noise versus density. So this black line is the line sigma t uh, I was showing before. So the basic instability line of the hydrotropic state. And you find that there are several different areas uh, in this diagram. So just below this transition line, there is a colored region here in which the uniform collective motion is unstable. So the color here codes, codes for the, the angle of the most unstable uh, direction of the, so the angle of the wave vector corresponding to the most unstable direction. Uh, below uh, this colored region, you have a region in white here in which, in which homogeneous collective motion is again stable. And then uh, again below, there is a blue region here in which uh, motion is again unstable, but we, ha we are not sure about the physical relevance of this region because we are uh, quite far here from the from this transition line around, around this, around which the, uh, the expansion was carried out. So this might be an artifact of the truncation and closure scheme. scheme. But uh, the existence of these two regions, so this instability region here and this stability region here, are confirmed by numerical simulations of uh, the Vicek model, for instance. Right. So now the question is to know, OK, so this here, collective Homogeneous collective motion is unstable, but what do you observe if you just simulate the equation? And what you observe, for instance, if you just assume that the system is invariant in the, in the right direction, so it reduces to a 1D problem, you have some, some trains of solitary waves like this, which can have uh, very different shapes at, uh, at short times, and they evolve at long time towards a regular train of, uh, of these solitary waves. So uh, where do you expect to find uh, these waves? Of course, you expect to find them in the region where collective motion is linearly unstable. But uh, you observe them actually a bit outside of this region also. So this is a phase diagram. Well, this is a diagram where uh, we plot just the global order parameter. So this is a space average of uh, the velocity, basically. So it's uh, it's an indicator of uh, collective motion. When it is non-zero, it means that there is collective motion in the system. And uh, as I said before, so as a function of noise, there is a region here below this threshold here and, uh, and this dotted line here in which the homogeneous flow is unstable. So this is a colored region I was showing in the previous plot. So here we indeed expect to find uh, these nonlinear waves. But what is, what is also interesting is that when you ad adiabatically go by slowly varying the parameters, you ad adiabatically, ad adiabatically go to uh, the regions where the homogeneous flows are stable. For instance, here in the, in the isotopic phase, you see that uh, these solitary waves can be maintained up to some point here, which is si significantly higher than the uh, than the transition point. Transition point here where the isotopic phase loses stability. Similarly, you can also obtain this solitary wave uh, at lower noise, so in regions where homogeneous flow is stable. You can also observe some uh, hy uh, hysteresis phenomenon. So by increasing the noise here, uh, you maintain the solitary waves up to a high value of the noise. And when you decrease again the noise, you jump, for instance, here, 
to the solitary waves at the, at the noise which is below. So actually this value is not really well defined, it depends on the numerical noise in your simulations and so on. Okay, so I will now try to go fast uh, through the, the two last uh, cases I wanted to show. So now in, we can consider basically the same kind of model, but instead of considering uh, polar inter ferromagnetic interactions as before, so it was uh, something similar to that, we can say, okay, let's keep the same rule as before if the angle uh, between particles which are colliding is acute. And if not, uh, for instance, if particles are colliding in this way, let's take the particles as, as um, anti-parallel after collision. So this is a dynamics which is inspired by the dynamics of rods. This is basically what uh, people observed in numerical simulations of, uh, of self-propelled rods. So you can apply the same program. You can do the, uh, exact, apply the same method and derive continuous equation. So here for convenience, uh, we keep complex notations for the order parameter because as soon as you have a nematic order parameter, you would need to use a tensor and it's not fully convenient. So actually in 2D, it's quite convenient to keep uh, the complex notation. Okay, so we get this uh, rather complicated equations, which I will not really comment, but you can study the stability uh, of, this, of the different states of this equation and you find a phase diagram which is rather similar to the one we had before. So this is again sigma squared as a function of noise. Uh, sorry, this is noise amplitude as a function of density. And you see same type of stability properties. So here you have the transition line uh, which uh, defines the limit of stability of the hydrotopic phase. So hydrotopic phase is here. Here the hydrotopic phase is unstable and you recover again this white region where the homogeneous nematic phase is stable. This colored region where the homogeneous nematic phase is unstable and again this instability region which we believe to be an artifact of uh, the truncation. Because again our derivation is supposed to be valid close to, uh, close to here. Right, so uh, again, what is interesting is uh, what appears here in this unstable region because uh, there are non-trivial uh, spatial temporal patterns which may appear since homogeneous states are unstable. So in numerical simulations, we observe uh, a band uh, like this. So for instance, this is a profile you obtain for the nematic order parameter. So there is nematic order within a band and no nematic order outside the band. Uh, there are here periodic boundary conditions. And actually you can even determine analytically the profile of uh, this band. So it has this uh, relatively simple shape. And then you can study the linear stability of, uh, of this band, meaning the stability against possible undulational uh, perturbation in the transverse direction, so perpendicular to the board here. And you find actually that uh, the band is linearly unstable, but non at the nonlinear level, it is uh, relatively stable. It is what you observe by doing relatively large numerical integration of the equation, except when the, ba when the band is uh, becoming uh, very thin. So actually the width of this band depends on when you are uh, in this phase diagram. So it depends on density and noise. And when the band is becoming thin, it tends to break and to form complex spatial temporal patterns. But otherwise, it seems to be relatively stable at the nonlinear level. What happens is just that there are fluctuations of the boundary of the band. Um, so as for the polar case, um, these nonlinear structures are also, fine, are also found outside the region of the uh, linear instability of uh, the homogeneous ordered state. So this is what you see uh, here in this diagram. So you recover our basic instability line sigma t. There's a line sigma s 
were uh, below which uh, collective order or uh, nematic homogeneous order is linearly stable. So linear instability occurs in this area between sigma t and sigma s, but these nonlinear bands can be found between these two lines, sigma max and sigma min. So, uh, so in these two regions, there are uh, coexistence of two possible states, meaning either you are in a homogeneous state or you can have these nonlinear bands. Okay, I'm basically done. I just wanted to show you rather briefly that if you consider uh, last case by again varying a little bit the symmetries, you can find something which is uh, actually very similar to this uh, self propelled rod case. And this is by considering instead of self propelled rods, which just move forward along their velocity vector, you consider what we call the active pneumatic particle, meaning that particles are just vibrating back and forth along uh, their heading vector. And they also interact through the same rules as before. So this case is actually a little bit simpler to study um, because you, due to this uh, back and forth motion, you can get rid of the polar or the parameter. Only nematic uh, order is possible here. And so the equations are a little bit simpler here. So you have a uh, continuity equation for the density, which involves a coupling to the nematic order parameter. And you have an equation uh, for uh, the nematic order parameter, which is not so complicated. So it is a kind of ginzburg landau equation with uh, some coupling to the density parameter. So I can just show briefly that uh, the stability diagrams look very, very similar. So uh, again, you find exactly the same, I mean, almost quantitatively the same diagram as for the self propelled rod case with uh, this basic transition line. So uh, homogeneous order is linearly unstable in this direction, but you find then these nonlinear bands. So uh, this is the band profile for density, band profile for pneumatic order parameter. And just as before, these bands exist uh, beyond the linear instability region. Uh, again, as before, you can study analytically the stability of uh, these nonlinear bands. So the profile analytically is basically the same. You find also that the band is linearly unstable. The difference here is that, uh, contrary to the previous case, the band is never uh, nonlinearly stable. So here it's some, somehow clearer, because the band always have a complex dynamics and somehow breaks on, uh, on long time scales. So you see, for instance, here what happens for a band which is relatively large. But if you look a movie on a longer time scale, you, you will see that the band breaks and changes direction, etc. And if you take a thin band, you will also have a complex spatiotemporal motion. So it means that here, uh, when this band stent is present, due to this chaotic dynamics, you cannot have collective order. So if you compute at the global, you compute the average global uh, order parameter, average over a long window of time, you will find that it is zero. So, so as soon as you go into this state band, uh, there is no collective motion. Oh, sorry, no, no ordered state. Here it's not collective motion because it's pneumatic. Right, okay. So uh, let me just summarize what we have done. So first of all, from the methodological uh, perspective, we have obtained a generic method to derive continuous equations, so for uh, underdamped systems of particles in two dimensions, which interact through binary alignment collisions. Uh, through these methods, uh, so all the transport coefficients appearing in these continuous equations are known as a function of microscopic parameters like noise and, uh, and local density. And this gives a simple phase diagram because there, is only, there are only two control parameters, the density and the, and the noise. 
Uh, we are considering uh, or have considered some extensions. So for instance, you can consider systems with non-metric or topological interaction, meaning that instead of considering a fixed interaction radius, a fixed distance of interaction, you interact with your topological number. So it's kind of a density, locally density invariant. Uh, it's actually an important case, for instance, in a study of birds, because it has been shown that uh, at least in starling flocks, uh, a given bird interacts with its neighbor, uh, with its topological neighbors, uh, independently of the local density. So you can put some scaling factor on the flock and the, the, inter the particles of the birds with which a given bird interacts will be the same. Uh, okay, we can also include positional diffusion in the microscopic model, and this leads to some anisotropic diffusion term in the continuous equation. So, this is a generalization that can be taken into account. And what we are currently doing is to also include some repulsions between uh, particles in the case of self propelled worlds, because this may lead to some interesting behavior at the level of uh, nematic defects. Right, uh, now from the point of view of the stability properties, uh, so we have seen that a generic scenario emerges in which uh, there is, first of all, a homogeneous ordered state that exists below some transition line in this not density plane. This ordered state can be either polar or nematic, depending on the interaction symmetries. And we have seen that uh, close to the transition line, there's a generic instability of this ordered state. And when this uh, homogeneous ordered state is linearly unstable, we have the onset of uh, nonlinear patterns in the form of bands, basically, uh, which can either be stable in the polar case, in this case, they just move forward, or in the nematic case, uh, they can be unstable and enter some chaotic regime. So from the point of view of the order disorder transition, uh, actually, one has to look uh, carefully at the stability properties of this nonlinear st structure because the global order transition, order disorder transition line is actually determined by these stability properties. So, either uh, this nonlinear structure carries some global order, as in the case of uh, polar, polar bands, and in this case, uh, so the state with li nonlinear structure will be ordered. Or, as for the last case I showed, last nematic case, uh, it's still disordered on large scale, so the uh, order disorder transition is pushed, pushed below this, uh, non -linear, this area of nonlinear structure in the phase diagram. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eric, for being on time. Questions? Yes. So, recently, uh, Andrea Kavana did some. Uh, Experiment with this uh, BJS mosquito-like. Uh, ah, okay. There it was. Uh, they suggested it to be close to criticality or something. The large density fluctuation, and they can uh, your theory can suggest uh, some of this. Or it, uh, uh, no, so actually here we have uh, no. What is it to improve the data? Well, okay. So yeah. here, here there is no attraction, so we cannot model any swarm. We have to put some finite volume with periodic boundary conditions usually, uh, just to fix the density. So uh, to go further, one needs to include attractive interactions. This has been done numerically uh, about 10 years ago by uh, Grégoire and Chate. So they included some uh, Lennard Jones-like forces between the particle, and they could model uh, some kind of liquid states. So at that, at that time, I don't think they were really looking at this uh, possibly long-range correlations or correlation on system size, although one should have to check carefully. But in the framework of what we did, since there is no attraction forces, we cannot uh, model anything like this. Any other questions? So I have one question. So you talked about this, uh, uh, whether diffusion properties can change spatially and so on. So in one of the generalizations, yes. So there are uh, cases where, well, I mean, I think this is a simulation step only where it has uh, some bizarre structure and then you're looking at the population. So can you handle such things within this framework or what, what do you expect for this? Time pattern formation that you see? 
Right, so uh, we didn't check that because uh, here I was mentioning something slightly different. I was just mentioning uh, the fact of having some positional diffusion in the motion of, of, of uh, particles at the microscopic level. So what we have considered is simply a motion along the heading vector, for instance, and no, no diffusion at the microscopic level. If you take into account this positional diffusion, this leads to some uh, further diffusion terms, which uh, some of them being an isotropic contrary to what I had in the equation. Uh, okay, apart from that, surely you can consider some positional diffusion, which could also depend on space due to some environment. This we did not do. Uh, I see no reason why this could not be included in this framework, surely it can be included. Uh, then what it would give, I don't really know. So I know that in Perwani's per work, uh, I think if I remember correctly, it generates some clusters uh, around the obstacles. And these clusters are hard to obtain this kind of approach, I think, because uh, it's supposed to be limited to a binary collision. So I didn't really insi insist on this, fact, but on this fact, but as all Boltzmann type approaches, you need to go on the low density limit. So as soon as you go in these cluster phases, uh, you kind of break the assumptions of the theory, so you cannot really describe what happens. So in this case, I think you have to result to numerical simulations but uh, yeah but surely yeah we could we could at least uh, introduce some space dependent positional disorder or diffusion or something like that yeah this could be done Any other questions? If not, let's